Hello, today's Bible study comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 44, and reads as follows. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there with no one which no one has ever written, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, where are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the coat, its owners asked him, why are you untying the coat? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the coat, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, Jesus spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and circle you and him you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you do not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Wow. Well, this is Jesus on his pathway to Jerusalem. And he gets there. After Jesus said this, and they're speaking of the parables where he was explaining, he went on ahead. He set out, and he was going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples out. Now, he sent the disciples out to do a task. And he says to them, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, and you will find a colt tied. Now, Jesus knew all this. This was this was something that you have to wonder, man, the Lord had it all set up. Everything was in line, in order. And this was the, the last, pretty much the last week before his crucifixion. So the disciples went, and the arrangements that were made were already there. His He was coming to Jerusalem. He wasn't hiding, so... Jesus had, had already been in Jerusalem a bunch of times before, but this time was a special time, too, remember. Um, this, this was about this journey to Jerusalem. Now, he told them you will find a coat on which no one has ever sat. So, Jesus had a coat that no one ever sat on. No man, no woman had ever sat on this coat, but this must have been a special coat, and it had to have been a special coat to be there ready for him, and even with the simple fact, if the owners came out, tell them who sent you. Ain't that what he told them? He said, those who were sent ahead found, ahead went and found it, just as Jesus had told them, as they were untying the coat, its owners asked them, why are you untying the coat? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And if you look at verse 31, it says, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the, Lord's, the Lord needs it. And they were obedient to what he said. And you never hear anything about the owner of the coat saying another word. The coat was the Mount of Christ. This man of great miracles, this man of great compassion, 
this man of great love and peace and kindness, this teacher of wisdom and knowledge of the spiritual world and the fact that he related it to your physical world and that you could still understand it on two levels and then took the time to tell you what it was. This was for him. And, you know, most kings would come in on a horse, garbed in this, armored in that. Jesus came in a quiet, demure way with a cult that had never been written. There was nothing about this except that this cult was for a royal soul. That's what was customary for royalty. These cults were for royalty. And who was more royal than the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords? So he enters Jerusalem. <laughs> and he comes in on his royal steed, if you want to call it that. And the entry into Jerusalem, this was a victory for Christ, but it was a victory for us just watching our Savior be totally obedient to his Father, even when he didn't want to do it, he didn't take it as his way, he took it as Yahweh. And when Yahweh told him to do it, he did it. That was a victory for him. And it is a victory for us on obedience and faithfulness. And we haven't even got to the cross yet. Jesus is good. And this was also, all of this was prearranged, this horse. Oh, man, in verses 35 through 40, when it gets to the parts where it says, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the coat, and put Jesus on it. Listen to what this says. They brought it to Jesus. They put their cloaks on it. And then they placed Jesus on the coat. They understood royalty or the importance of this and who Jesus was. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Uh-oh, the red carpet treatment. They put their cloaks on the road and let a colt carrying our Savior walk over their cloaks. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And the disciples were many. You know, sometimes we, we, we think of the apostles and we say the 12, but if you look in, I want to say it's uh, Luke 10 and 1, it's the gospel, chapter 10, verse 1. After they came back from f doing their miracles, Jesus sent out 72 disciples. They went out two by twos. But there were many disciples. And it says, The disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. They had seen him working. They had been with him on this journey in doubt and fear not trusting to strength, to joy, to knowing who he is. And they said, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh-oh. Blessed is the Messiah who comes in the name of the Lord. They know. The people know. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. They're giving praise out. Now, the Pharisees are still around. These dudes, they like fungus. 
Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. <laughs> ah, there was no need to. They was giving praise, fool. Why would I have to? Because their praise was making you uncomfortable. Oh, you didn't get the glory you thought you deserved, Pharisees. And it bothered them. And it made them know that they were defeated. And they weren't defeated with weapons. There was no mass destruction except of egos and pride and the fact that Christ did things out of love. While y'all were doing ill-gotten gains and putting all these extra laws and burdens on people that you yourselves weren't following. The fact that you claim to be the keepers of the law and the great scholars, but you couldn't take in instruction from the true teacher, the true rabbi. And what did you get? You got all these disciples and people praising them. And nothing will discourage Satan more than us praising the Lord. See, when you're disobedient, I'm just going to say it, you slap the Lord in the face. But when you're obedient, you straight up stomp Satan. And Satan don't like that. His followers don't like that. And they was tired of hearing about the praises and the worship that was being given. When your heart and mind is on God like his disciples were, Satan loses all the time. These Pharisees in their wicked ways were losing. And they wanted him to rebuke. He wanted Jesus to rebuke them praising him. You idiots. I tell you that these should keep silent. The stones would immediately cry out. Jesus was just telling them when the Pharisees told the people to be quiet who was praising him and received him as king and Messiah and knew who he was and put their cloaks on the ground. Mm. Jesus was going to be praised this day. Jesus did everything he could to discourage people from publicly celebrating him as Messiah during his life. But here on this day, on this journey, on this walk to get this beating, to be crucified on the cross for sins that I have never committed, for not ever having a sin, for being faithful the whole time for being obedient to God the whole time, for doing my Father's will. You can praise publicly. You can adore the Messiah publicly. And thank God that we have the ability to praise him and thank him publicly now. Then it says the stones would immediately cry out. Everything praises God. The trees, the hills, it's in the Bible. The oceans, the rivers, the mountains, all of that. Everything that doesn't worry about how to feed, they praise God. When the flowers bloom, they praise God. When the grass grows, it praises God. If you look in the book of Psalm, you'll see it in the, in the book of Psalm where it speaks to it. But everything praises God. And the stones would even cry out if they stopped praising him. So everything created praises God. Because guess who created everything? So... The stones would immediately cry out if they stopped. Everything praises him. But the stones didn't have to that day because the multitude, the multitude was praising Jesus. And it didn't stop. They just kept going. 
with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. The praise kept coming. They were remembering what they had seen, what Jesus had done, what Jesus had said. And if you look in your life and you look back and you sit there sometime and you say, God, I'm looking at where I was and where you brought me, you'll sit there and start feeling the praise in yourself because he has been that good to you. He has done that much for you. He has placed you where you weren't before. And your faith will keep having him place you. He didn't say there wasn't going to be some trials and tribulations, that there wasn't going to be some suffering, because Jesus had all this. He faced it like a man like we are. He was human. And even going to the cross where he was about to be crucified and beat, he was still facing the same trials and tribulations. And the people realized that the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, and the Messiah was here. And they knew how good it was, as we all should. Oh, excuse me. Hmm. So, we get to verse 43, and it says, The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. Call on Jesus when that happens. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children. Within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another because you do not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Uh-oh. You're going to have some problems, and you didn't call on God. See, this was a moment, a deep moment for Jesus because he was hurt. They were not for his own fate in Jerusalem, but the fate of the city itself. Jesus wasn't even worried about him at this time. Jesus was sobbing, crying because of these lost opportunities that the people didn't see. He was hurting because of what we missed out on. He had been to the city, and he desired to save the city from this destruction and show them what this thing of peace was. But they were spiritually not seeing him. They were missing him. They didn't understand his true reason for being here. So they couldn't escape this destruction. If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. Remember, the Jewish people at this time had rejected Jesus. And most followed the leaders. This is the true teacher, Jesus the Christ. These are people. But he said, if you had known Jesus and his works, you knew of his works, you heard of his works as Messiah, they could have been spared. But they they didn't they didn't take it in. They were looking to destroy him themselves because he was messing up money. He was messing up man's traditions. He was messing up ways of man. You know, and I have to tell you, we celebrate holidays and not one is in the Bible. We don't celebrate holy days and they're in the Bible. Man's traditions. This was important because it was likely the day that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem. And if you look back, Daniel said that it would be 483 years of the Jewish calendar from the day of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the day the Messiah would come to Jerusalem. And remember, we had a 400 plus years 
when the Lord wasn't speaking to us before John came out of the wilderness. And you count Jesus' lifetime and Daniel is right there. Jerusalem meant city of peace. It means city of peace. But they didn't know that Jesus was Prince of Peace. They didn't know that Jesus makes the peace. And the surrounding of the city was laying siege to it. The destruction of the city, the killing of the city's inhabitants, the complete leveling of this city was going to happen. No Jesus.